Welcome to Courageous Presbyterian Church on this third Sunday of Advent. Uh, remember, today is the last day you can turn in your point set order, so if you're in your point set, it's turning in today. Are there any other announcements? Let's turn our hearts and minds to silent prayer. Y'all may be seated. Now, I, oh, I'm sorry. I, you know what I'm going to do? What? I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to sit right here and let you 
right, <laughs> right, right here. Right there. Okay, yes. <laughs> this is a reading from the prophet Zephaniah. Sing, daughter of Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice to you with singing. The third candle that we light is pink and represents joy. As the coming of Jesus, our Savior, draws near, our joy builds with anticipation of his birth. Let us pray. We joyfully praise you, O Lord, for the fulfillment of your promise of a Savior and what that means in our lives. Thank you for the gift of salvation through the birth of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Is it all right for me to... Yeah, yeah, okay, so it's my turn. It's your turn. Okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, oh, uh, and I, I certainly appreciate it. And well done. Oh. Well done. Uh, I, I've got a question for you. Who is handling the poinsettias? The poinsettia sales is, is the person... Oh, you're, you're handling it? Uh, because I, is it okay if I share with them something that I heard about the poinsettias because it's due today? It's okay. Now, this is, this is really, really going to ex be exciting. Uh, normally, they don't allow you to order but like five poinsettias, but I think they're waiving that. You can order up to 50 poinsettias today. So just sign that, sign that little sheet. 50 of them. Imagine what your house will look like later. Well, this gives me something to confess. And just a little bit, we, we have come to, we've got to the part of the service when we are approaching God in confession. And since we all sin, that seems the right thing to do. And since we commit sins not just as individuals, but also as communities, we want to confess as a community. And that's what we'll do by uh, reading the prayer that's in the bulletin. We'll do that together. And then we'll follow it with just a brief time for individual and personal confession. So, brothers and sisters, as God's people, let's go to him now in prayer. Almighty God, we confess that we have sinned against you. Often we make following Jesus unnecessarily complicated. We create loopholes and exceptions to excuse ourselves even when your word is clear. As a result, our response to you becomes partial, inconsistent, and confused. Gracious Lord, forgive us and give us the courage to obey you even when obedience is difficult and uncomfortable. Amen. Lord God, in this silence that follows here, these prayers we lift up to you, and Lord, have mercy upon us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us as much as you do. And thank you for listening to us. But right now, we thank you for forgiving us. And we know that we've been forgiven because we've confessed these sins in the name of Christ our Savior. In fact, it's in his name we now pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news of the gospel. This saying is sure and worthy of universal acceptance that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all this good. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand.
Very good, guys. And, and Joe, you kind of got jiggy there. As much as I can. As much as you can in, in the Presbyterian Church. That's pretty exciting. Uh, the uh, scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the third chapter, beginning with the seventh verse. Now, if you got your Bibles with you, uh, please feel free to long. If not, we got pew Bibles you can use. Hear now the word of God as written by the evangelist Luke. Then he said to those who came from the crowds to be baptized by it, offspring of serpents, who pointed out to you to flee from the future wrath. Now bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and don't start to say to yourselves, As a father, we have Abraham. For I say to you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. But already even the axe is lying upon the root of the trees. Then all trees that don't bear good fruit are cut, cut out and cast into the fire. And the crowd began to ask him, saying, Then, then what should we do? He answered and said to them, The one who has two tunics, let him share with one who doesn't have. And the one who has food, similarly let him do. And even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they said to him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Nothing more than you're commanded, collect. And those in the army also asked him, saying, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, you should extort nothing. And you shouldn't accuse anyone falsely and be satisfied with your wages. And because the people were waiting and they were all debating in their heart concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered and said to them all, I myself baptize in water baptize you. But a person is coming who is more powerful than me, whose, whose sandal thong I'm not worthy to loosen. He himself will baptize in Holy Spirit and fire, whose winnowing shovel is in his hand to clean thoroughly his threshing floor and to gather the grain into his storehouse. But the shaft will be burned up in fire unquenchable. Then also many other appeals he brought good news to the people. Amen. Praise God for this reading from his word. Let's have a brief word of prayer together. Almighty God, you are present here with us, and for that we are truly grateful. Inspire the words we've heard, and inspire the words we're about to hear, that they may make a difference in the way we live. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Now, I've got a, a question for you. Uh, do any of y'all ever feel kind of emotional when you're putting out your Christmas decorations? Do you, do you, do you ever feel kind of, you, you, you don't. You, you don't put them out at all. Oh, oh, so you're kind of more like a Scrooge. That's why you don't feel emotional. Okay, good. But you do, mainly because he's not helping. Right, okay. Uh, the, um, but you, so you're, some, you feel emotional. You, some, some of y'all feel emotional. Now, why is it that you feel emotional? Why do you think you feel emotional? Because you're putting them out when the Browns are playing? Okay, I understand that. Uh, why, why do you feel emotional? Memories. There's memories attached. Okay, there's memories. You got memories. I know, I know that's what I feel when we put out Christmas, which we did last, last Sunday over the house. I, I started to feel kind of emotional as I put them out. And part of the reason was so many of them are associated with my daughter when she was little. No, 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 that's silly. Or when she was little, right? Uh, because Debbie buys special ornaments, so, you know, putting out the My Little Pony ornament, you know, on the tree, and we put out the Hannah Montana ornament, and, and, uh, uh, the Jonas Brothers, we had a Jonas Brother, uh, we put all that, and it brought, yeah, see, you're getting emotional about Jonas Brothers, <laughs> I can see Joe, uh, the, uh, but, it, it, you know, we had all the memories, and we put out the pictures, because we've got the pictures of Maggie, you know, sitting on Santa's lap, of course, we've got two of them with uh, Maggie on his lap, but also Debbie and I, 
because Maggie would otherwise have cried. So there's a picture of me on Santa's lap, which is not very pleasant. Uh, but we've got, we've got all these, these pictures, and they bring back the memories. Of, of Christmases when uh, she was small and, and it's a, uh, I, I tell people that somewhere in a person's life, uh, young person's life, uh, and you may, you may understand this, Christmas shifts from a time of wonder to a time of acquisition. You know, so so we kind of we kind of move to that, and and that kind of there's a part of me that gets kind of sad, but the one thing that doesn't make me sad at all is the fact that now Maggie is getting stuff that doesn't need to be put together anymore. You know, because you don't, uh, at least the putting together, Debbie does, because she's putting a sweater with pants and shoes and stuff. The st she doesn't get the toys that used to, you know, really challenge me on Christmas Eve night and into Christmas morning. Uh, I remember about, I think it was like 10 years ago, Maggie is uh, uh, 17, so maybe it was 11 years ago. Uh, we, Maggie got this My Little Pony water park. A My Little, little Pony water park. It was great. Uh, there were in the My Little Pony water park 500 pieces. 500 pieces. And they all looked the same. All of them look the same. And I had the instructions there because I'm kind of a guy governed by instructions. And on the instructions there were all these dotted and dashed lines going all over the place. And they're going around these labeled pieces and they, the pieces were stamped with these little tiny letters that you can not make out. It was not easy, right? And I'll tell you, if you couldn't understand the English directions, which were obviously written by somebody for whom English was a second language, you could always use the directions written in what? Chinese, or German, or Spanish, or, and my, one of my favorites is the Portuguese, for all the Portuguese folks that are put, and then this one language I couldn't even identify. You know, I guess it was Esperanto or something. I didn't know what it was. Uh, putting together this thing was not, not easy. And it took a long, long time. Uh, and, and I've got to tell you, that part of Christmas I don't miss. The part that has easy to follow instructions. But you know, as I, as I think about it, or as I thought about it, there are times when I kind of wish we would get the same thing from God, you know? I mean, when it comes to living the Christian life, wouldn't it be great to have some easy-to-follow instructions? Well, we, we do, but we gotta need to talk about that just a little bit. You know, first, living as a Christian isn't a cakewalk, right? I mean, it's, it's really, really confusing. And... Um, it's not as though there aren't people telling us what to do, right? We got all kinds of people that tell us exactly what we should be doing. I mean, my goodness gracious, every minister and his brother is telling us something different we should or should not be doing, right? And even though some of the stuff is incredibly shallow and empty of meaning, you know, stuff that only involves making some vague promises. They, they, what they tell us change from church to church to church. You see, what we should be doing is, 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 is kind of a mess, right? And, and we say, well, we got the Bible, right? We got the Bible. That tells us. Would you do me a favor right now? There's a Bible in each, each pew or in front. Would you take that Bible out? Uh, would you, and would you turn to the back? The very end, the end of the Bible, the last one that has a number on the page. Would somebody give me the number, the page number on that last page? 244. What's that? 
244. Now, that's clearly they're starting over with something else. Because when you hold that book up, does it look like there's 244 pages? Heck no! More. The Bible I read at home has 1,700 pages. Man! That's almost as long as the instructions for the My Little Pony Water Park. You know, so we got the Bible, but does anybody know 1,700 pages? Or more. Or more, yeah. Especially if it's written in Portuguese. <laughs> you know? It's... <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. I would be much happier if it were easy to follow instructions. So what we should be doing, well that's kind of, kind of difficult to know. And then we've got how we should be doing it. Even if we know what, we're not entirely sure about how, right? I mean they tell us to give our life to Jesus, right? I love that. Give your life to Jesus. That's what? Oh, that's easy, right? Well, how exactly do you do it? How do you give your life to Jesus other than saying, I gave my life to Jesus? How do you do it? How do you do it? Does it mean I have to change jobs? Change friends? Change my sleeping habits? Change my diet? Change my friends? Change my socks? What does it mean to give my life to Jesus? How do I do it? Does it mean I have to change what I eat? Where to go? Whom I'm with? What team I follow? Of course, let me give you a clue. Following the Indianapolis Colts helps. Man, I don't know. When I was in high school, I had a friend of mine. Gave his life to Jesus. Gave his life to Jesus. You know what he was told to do? <laughs> this is good. Gave his life to Jesus. He was told to burn his Olivia Newton-John albums. <laughs> okay, that's how you do it. And you know what? He did it. So we know what. We're, we're vague on what we should we do, be doing. But even if we got the what, how do you do it other than using the right words is really tough. And then you got, why am I doing it? Why am I doing it? Am I doing it to get to heaven? Or maybe to be more blessed? Which means I'll be more successful at work and home and I'll be able to deal, you know, maybe these bad Achilles tendons that I've got will heal up and the rift between my sister and I will be healed. You know, that sounds sort of like a multiple choice test. Is it A? Is it B? Is it C? Is it D? All of the above? I don't know why. And although I have a Bible, like I said, we got the Bible. Man, my Bible is long. And have you seen the print in those things? Cheese Louise. And guess what? There's no index in the back. Easy to follow instructions on how to live a Christian life? I think not. And I'll tell you, for that reason, I believe we can be truly grateful for what John the Baptist had to say in the passage we've got, we read today from Luke. And I'll tell you what. Right here, he gives us a Reader's Digest guide for the Christian life. It's sort of like Christianity for dummies. Something for which, speaking for myself, I am sincerely grateful. I mean, just look at what he taught. And notice that he tells us exactly what and how and why. I mean, think about the what. He tells us exactly what the Christian life is all about. And he does it by offering two commandments. You see, after calling the crowd a bunch of snakes, which sounds a little bit like a Rudiger family reunion, first John said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, the word repentance in Greek literally means to change one's mind, to turn one's mind. So what John was challenging us to do was to change the way we think. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. 
In other words, instead of saying to ourselves that God loves us because we're so stupid good. Or that we're good because we obey most of the commandments, at least the important ones. And you know the important ones. We know those. You know, the ones that really count and the ones that God let slide. Or that we're certainly not as bad as those other people over there. I mean, instead of assuming that no matter how I put it, I can do it myself. Repentance may mean me saying to myself and saying to God and saying to you, I can't do it. I can't be good enough. Or obedient enough, or righteous enough, enough, or spiritual enough. Because guess what? I am a sinner. Well, geez Louise, that was a little harsh right before Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. I am a sinner. And you know what? So are you. That's something we share. Maybe it's like the first step in one of those 12-step programs. You know the first step? That I am powerless and my life has become unmanageable. Therefore, I need help. You see, I think that's repentance. But more than that, John said we need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Which means this change in attitude and perspective is not supposed to be private. You see, between me and God, I hear that a lot. Well, you don't know what he's thinking. You don't know what's on the inside. That's not what he's, John's talking about here. It's got to be seen in the lives we live and the relationships we build. If it's not, it's not worth anything. You see, that's one thing Christians need to do. And second, we should never, ever say among ourselves, as father, we have Abraham. You see, for John, I shouldn't see myself as more important than I am. And I don't need my wife to tell me that. In other words, I just can't assume that I'm something special because Abraham is my spiritual father. Therefore, maybe I shouldn't assume that I'm on the inside, if you know what I mean. Because I've accepted Jesus as my personal Savior and gave my life to Him. Man, trusting Jesus is the first step, not the last step. And maybe I shouldn't assume that I am this big old spiritual deal because I've been a member of this church my whole life. Or because my family has been here since the ark hit dry land. I'm telling you, if God can turn stones into Jews, He can do the same thing with born-again believers. And 50-year members. And I sure can't assume that I'm better or more spiritual than you because I am uh, clergy. Man, I've known more than a few ministers who seem to have more in common with rocks than with people. For John, bear fruit and don't assume that's what Christians do. But you know, he doesn't stop there. That's, he's got the what. He doesn't stop with the what. He also tells us how to do it. And this is really cool. I mean, when, after he'd gone on this, when the crowds asked him, then what should we do? Great question, right? He answered and said to them, the one who has two tunics, let him share with one who doesn't have. The one who has food, similarly let him do. In other words, how can we live the Christian life? It comes down to one word. How do we live the Christian life? John says, one word. 
share. How do we live the Christian life? Share. Share what you got with others. Share with folks that aren't as fortunate as us. Share, but not just because we got a whole bunch of stuff we want to get rid of. If we have only two, we can do what? Share one. Man, that's how you do it. It's not rocket science. But just in case we can't figure it out, you know, we're kind of more like rocks up here than people. John got specific. And when he talked to the tax collectors and soldiers, I'll tell you, he, and, and when you think about these two groups, they're about as far away from acceptable folks in first century Palestine than you could get. I mean, you think about the tax collectors. Well, now we love our tax collectors because we realize they serve a, an important governmental function, right? And so when you get a letter from your a tax collector, you're, you rejoice in. And if they're calling you in, that makes you what? Real happy. Real happy, right? Because you want to pay your fair share, right? And if they found discrepancies, you certainly want to increase your payment. Am I not right? <laughs> But they were even viewed worse in the first century. And I'll tell you, soldiers, these weren't, you know, soldiers, you know, we see on television. This was occupying troops. Jews did not look at Roman soldiers as their friends. They were as far from acceptable as you could get. And yet, these dregs of society were still coming to John the Baptist. And he told them exactly how they could respond. And it's amazing. I think it's amazing. He didn't tell them to quit their jobs. Tax collectors were notoriously corrupt. You know, you know how tax collectors got paid in the first century? Oh, this is good. Well, in a way, the Romans told them how much, gave them a district, told them how much they expected from that district. And whatever they collected extra was theirs. And they had their own little army to convince people to pay their taxes that they paid for. That's what they did. They were notoriously corrupt. They collected as much as they wanted. He didn't tell them to quit their job. The Roman soldiers were occupying. They were occupiers. They weren't buddies. They were occupiers. Didn't tell them to quit their jobs either. Instead, he told them to do their jobs honestly and humbly. Now, I wonder if we could say the same thing to folks we don't like. Who have jobs of which we don't approve. Probably not. I don't think I could. Because then we couldn't talk about them, right? And we couldn't look down on them. No, according to John... As it comes to how anybody, if they're honest and humble, can respond to Jesus Christ. And finally, the why. So we got the what, we got the how, finally the why. John gives us that too. Why do we do what we do and why do we even care how we do it? Well, that's here too. Just listen. I myself in water baptize you, but a person is coming who is more powerful than me, whose sandal thong I am not worthy to loosen. He himself will baptize in Holy Spirit and fire, whose winnowing shovel is in his hands to clean thoroughly his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his storehouse, but the shaft will be burnt up in unquenchable fire. You see, when you get right down to it, there's only one reason for living the Christian life. And it centers on the person whose birth we're going to celebrate in about a week and a half. And I'm talking about the one whose death broke the power of sin. Man, he broke the power, he set us free. And whose resurrection offers us hope. The one who baptized his disciples then and baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, tongues of fire. Just like he's the reason for the season, 
He can and should be the reason for everything we say and do. Man, that's why we respond. It's not about us. It's about Him. Now, like I said, decorating is a mixture of emotions. Happy because Christmas is coming up, coming up and the decorations look pretty, but a little bit sad because we remember, or I remember, the way things used to be. Of course, I don't get particularly sad when I think about the My Little Pony water park that Maggie played with on Christmas morning and never again. That doesn't make me sad at all. But you know, as we move into the rest of our lives, we have reason today to feel joy. Because although that little, those toys frustrate us because they never really do have easy to follow instructions. It's like building an Ikea dresser. Christianity does. And we can see it right here in what John taught. You see, right now, I know what to do, and so do you. We know what to do. We're supposed to bear fruit and not see ourselves as more important than we are. And we know how to do it. Simply to share what we've got with others. And to conduct our way, ourselves in a way that's honest and humble. In fact, I even know why I'm doing it. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born in Bethlehem, and you know what? The entire world changed. You see, that's what it's all about. And that's what I call easy-to-follow instructions. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, you've given us a guide here. Now, you're not going to pry our eyes open and force us to read them. Read it. You're not going to necessarily soften our brain. Maybe you can, but we certainly have a role to play in that so that we pay attention to it. And you're certainly not going to force us to, to follow your example. So help us to make the decision that we're going we're to trust you. We're going to do what you've called us to do. You, we're going to do it how you've called us to do it. And we're going to do it because our focus is on you and not self. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, let's all stand and let's sing together hymn 10. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know ten, hymn 10. Do y'all know it? Okay. Well, this will be exciting. You know, because, do you know it? Do you know this, this one? Of course you do. All right, let's all stand and let's sing hymn 10 on Jordan's Bank the Baptist Cry.
You all may be seated. Now, God's given us the opportunity to come to Him in prayer. Are there any particular needs or concerns anybody might have to, to share? Yes. Yes, I'd like prayers for my sister and her husband. They're both reaching the end of the uh, life here. Okay. Yeah. And the family is not... Their kids are scattered throughout the country. That makes it, makes it really hard. That makes it really hard. So let's, we'll pray for... Sandy and Ron. Sandy and Ron and their families as they kind of come to grips with that. Other needs? Yeah. A neighbor and friend of ours was in a car accident on Thursday and they can't do anything for her until the swelling goes down and she has young grandkids. So it's going to be a rough Christmas. Oh, yeah. Uh, Tracy Sanders. Tracy Sanders. Thank you. So we want to lift her up in our prayers. Yes. Logan? Okay. We'll lift Logan up in our prayers. We also want, I think, to remember all the people that will be on the roads, you know, trying to get home for Christmas. Sometimes roads that are a little bit icy and, and such. So we want to pray sometimes college kids for patience uh, as they're heading home. Well, with these in mind and also the concerns we know within our own heart, let's go to God now in prayer. And I'll open and then you all will have the opportunity to lift some of your concerns to God and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So let's go before God now in prayer. Lord God, before we say anything else, we got to give you a, a big thank you. What a wonderful opportunity we have to gather in your name, to hear your word, to share in your presence. And, and we appreciate that because that's truly a privilege. So we thank you. Now, now Lord, as we, uh, as we not only approach Christmas, but also move beyond this season to the, the rest of our lives, uh, you know, our daily living, remind us of what being Christian is all about. You know, it's about sharing without thinking too highly of yourself. And we do it by, by being honest and sincere. Uh, and we do it because of you. So help us to stay focused on, on the what and the how and the why of, of Christian living. Uh, we ask this in your name. And now in the silence that follows, we're going to lift up to you those things that weigh heavy on our heart. Lord God, hear us as we pray. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for listening to us and, of course, loving us as much as you do. Again, we, we thank you for that. But right now, we, we thank you for responding to our needs. We know that you will because we've asked them in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts that we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, would you all come on out front to collect our offering?
Offertory Prayer. We offer these gifts that your kingdom may take shape here on earth, and that we may also be shaped in the giving by the one whose very life is given to us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our departing hymn is Watchmen Tell Us of the Night on page 20. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. And what are you called to do? Bear, fru bear fruit. And to do it with humility. How do you do it? We do it by sharing, right? And we share honestly. And we do it humbly. And why are we doing it? Woohoo! As I heard a wise woman say once. And to empower this walk, receive the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Amen.